Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. Today we're at South Lakes Park in Southwest Oklahoma City, and I'm joined by Skylar St. Ives. Now, skylar has been with the Wildlife Department for a few years now, but you've just taken on a brand new position that we're really excited about. Tell us about it. Well, it's R3 Fishing, which for those who don't know what the R3 initiative is, it's recruitment, retention, and reactivation of hunters and anglers. Recruitment being beginners, novice, those who either have had little to no exposure or they're looking to go for the first time. Retention is for anglers and hunters who have been out that you know need some extra boost, whether it be information, mentor programs, um, and then reactivation, those who have participated in the past um, and have either quit entirely or lapsed several years in between um, going. So this new position has been created by the agency in order to focus specifically on Oklahoma anglers. And some of our programs that we're gonna utilize to really help keep people engaged in fishing in Oklahoma are areas like here at South Lakes, close to home area. Um, we're building a learn to fish program, which will take youth and a family member or guardian and will supply them with a you know expert level advanced level angler to take them through these steps to eventually get them to that intermediate level which is self-sufficient you can go to the tackle shop you can go to the lake we've given you those skills that you can do it on your own and then hopefully pass that tradition on well skylar mentioned the close to home program being a vital important part of what he'll be doing and Recently, we were here when Paul George was on hand to help donate and dedicate this brand new dock here at South Lakes Park. This really caps off what has been a, an amazing partnership uh, between, I know, the city of Oklahoma City, state of Oklahoma and Department of Wildlife and Paul George. Uh, I'll never forget that very first press conference that he had on uh, Oklahoma City soil when he landed and he talked about all he could think about when he was flying in was all these gleaming ponds and lakes that he saw as he was flying across our landscape and how he couldn't wait to land and go fish in all those ponds. And right there I knew we had a guy that was after our own heart and somebody that we needed to hook right away. So I started here, fishing is something that's been true to my heart and as I've been here I've learned fishing is very big in Oklahoma um, so it almost uh, was perfect um, for myself. In three, two, one. Smile! Woo! <laughs> Want to give us a huge thanks to the people that helped create this amazing dock. It looks awesome, it looks dope, I can't wait to get out there. With that being said, should we break the dock in? Catch some fish? Yeah. I mean, his passion is fishing, um, so this is what he wants to do. And give it to the back to the kids to be able to get outdoors. Uh, that's what our mission is about, is really finding ways that we could try to get these kids to get outdoors and just experience the outdoor living. And one of the things that Paul wanted to do was actually um, build a fishing dock so that he can uh, supply that and have the kids capability of actually um, using the, the fishing dock. And his passion for fishing really helped open up some new opportunities for us to get our fishing in the schools program in some of those inner city schools in Oklahoma City that we had not been able to really get our programs into or, or get folks to show any interest in. No, I just want to thank Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. I want to definitely thank Oklahoma City um, just for embracing us. Um, this is where we started our foundation, so it means a lot to always come back into the city. Um, this is always going to be home for the foundation um, and also too for Paul. And so I just want to thank everybody that supported this, this doc. Uh, it's going to mean a lot to me and to Paul. Um, the fact that he is now with the LA Clippers and he had already had this doc planned and he honored that commitment. And not only did he honor it, but he came back here to Oklahoma City so he could be here while this doc was dedicated. That's a huge thing. And that just says a lot about his character and his commitment and his love for the outdoors. Go back, reach back. Throw it, and then you let the let the button go. Skyler, one of your challenges with the R3 initiative is to 
somehow reach some of those maybe non-traditional types of anglers and how do you plan to do that and maybe who are some of those types of groups? Well for years we've had our close to home program and our family fishing clinics and those have taken place in mostly urban areas across the state. Well to take that a step farther because some families you know they may not have heard about it so we in partnership with the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation are now a part of a program called the Mobile First Catch Center. We will have a trailer that is fully equipped for first time, intermediate, even expert anglers with the gear that we have. So instead of having new or maybe less exposed anglers come to us, we're coming to them. We're gonna bring the fishing to urban environments, which are you know, gonna help with all of our initiatives, um, just being able to be where the fish are without having people come to us. Man, that's awesome. Now, it's sometimes important to take a step back and, and really remind ourselves why that is important. Why, why is that important? Well, our next generation of anglers are probably not gonna look like our fathers and grandfathers. You know, they're not gonna be that. Right. As urban development continues to grow, especially in a state like Oklahoma, places like we're at right now at South Lakes, this was a farm pond 20 years ago. Now it's considered an urban fishery. So our next generation of anglers will probably be considered urban anglers. Bigger cities around the country, you have people fishing in downtown. There's nothing wrong with that. Those are, we want people to be where the fish are. And as we develop, we move around the fish. So we're gonna bring the fish into them. Well, I have a special friend that dates all the way back to our college days as fraternity brothers. Stephen Buck is the former executive director of the Office of Juvenile Corrections here in Oklahoma. And while he worked for the agency, he helped to initiate a program that capitalized on existing resources that they already had while introducing a brand new demographic to fishing, one like Skyla was mentioning. The Office of Juvenile Affairs has a very unique and candidly challenging message. We work with Oklahoma young people who have become involved with the judicial system or at risk of becoming involved with the system. And our, our goal is challenging. Uh, we have to introduce accountability for actions, but at the same time, and most importantly, provide young people the skills necessary to have a successful rehabilitation and become productive members of our community. Well, our campus um, there in Tecumseh is blessed with a tremendous natural resource, and that is a beautiful, what I would consider farm pond. It's actually larger than most farm ponds. And it's a truly an asset that we wanted to use. So we use fishing and out, candidly outdoor adventure for our young people for two reasons. Number one, it's a reward. It's a chance to have something that's a break from the typical uh, checkbox day that they might experience while they're in our facility. But number two, for many young people who come in our care, they've never been in a canoe, they've never had a chance to go out and try to, try to catch bass or any other type of fish, and it is such a unique, peaceful experience. It gives them a glimpse of life that, for many, they had never had. And so I think it's important for those two reasons. So as it relates to the mission of OGA, OJA, which is for both an accountability for public safety, but most importantly, the opportunity for rehabilitation, one thing we know that is most important in that trajectory is helping young people find a trusted adult mentor. And as you know from your own experience, and I certainly know from mine, there's nothing like the conversations you can have out working a farm pond or trolling in a lake or whatever, waiting for that fish to bite and the opportunity just to develop relationship and to process challenges you might have. So very much it's an opportunity for young people to develop stronger relationships. 
but it also allows for them to develop new diversions of their time. Perhaps they've never had an opportunity to participate in fishing or to take part in any type of, of wildlife engagement. It's a healthy pursuit. It's something that can be a lifetime activity and allows them to have a whole new trajectory of, of things to do. I love kids, and when I think about the kids that are part of my family and the kids I've been around, I've seen them make a lot of knuckle-headed mistakes, and I know our young people do that with quite a deal of frequency. And so for me, what makes me passionate every day is helping young people not be defined by their worst decision, but instead be defined by the opportunity that's in front of them. In that direction. In an ideal world, not only would this opportunity for outdoor recreation um, allow our young people to find success as youth. Hopefully it also turns into a generational plus for our state. Our state is blessed with some tremendous outdoor resources and this is an opportunity to introduce a whole new set of young people who typically may not have taken part in the work that you do. It allows them to find opportunity to do some things differently and who knows maybe we're training a future quail hunter or a, a future uh, duck hunter or maybe an outdoor angler. I, I never dreamed I would be in this position. Um, I, I go back to my earliest days and, and as a youngster my parents were public school educators and so through them I got to experience a lot of a lot of different ways that we got to engage with kids and that really prepared for me to understand the challenges facing a lot of kids. Not every child had the same opportunities I had growing up and then as I navigated through my career, I kept always drawing back to the standpoint that for Oklahoma's young people, there's better opportunity, there's, there's something there that can help them achieve fulfillment, um, it's achieve fulfillment in life. And so it's that passion to help Oklahoma kids achieve that really keeps me engaged day to day. This one activity is simply one activity. We have another facility that is a contracted facility, it's a group home, where the young men there, through their um, carpentry program, are actively building shelters for the canyon out near Hinton. Um, all of these matter and they all make a difference. I think if you spoke to any of us that grew up in an outdoors culture, uh, we're going to reflect very fondly on kicking bushes in the Oklahoma River bottoms, trying to hope we flush a covey of quail, or, or looking for that largemouth bass, or you know, even for some of us going noodling in the local uh, creek. All of this matters, and I think we all cherish this part of life, and it's something that makes our state very unique. We have a tremendous natural resource adjacent to our campus, and what can we do with that in the future? Can we en enhance other outdoor activities, perhaps some zip lining or some sort of, of challenge course, ropes course? Can we partner with other agencies like DHS to make that facility available to young children who are involved in foster care? There's a lot of uses for that asset. Um, the natural resource that we have and the ability to take advantage of those in a constructive way, it'll have significant value not only for today but also tomorrow. Thanks for letting me hang out today. I should do this more often. <laughs> the next time I'm out, some of you guys are going to be gone, yes, right? Mm -hmm. We're all going to have good passes? Yes, so, great. Okay, I want to make sure. So really, as, as we think about um, how we are using this at our facility, it's certainly going to help in terms of young people's behaviors. It's, it's a healthy interaction that they can have that will break the monotony of an everyday. And so we're very happy for that. And we think that the reward and just the, just the candidly, the 
um, calming of being outdoors will have that benefit. But, but broadly, this, this is important for our state, and I think we lose sight of how important of an economic engine that the, rec the outdoor recreation industry is to our state. And so hopefully we can do our part in facilitating our next generation of outdoors men and outdoors women. You know, Skylar, I've had the pleasure of being able to live within just a couple blocks of a close to home waters here in Oklahoma City for 20 years now. And so I know firsthand how, how convenient and valuable they are. What makes all of them throughout the state, though, unique? Well, the fact that they're partnerships with local municipalities where the agency, ODWC, we provide fish and fish feeders at most, and then they provide the maintenance to the grounds and the facilities, which is a perfect combination for urban families to have a safe environment to go that's well maintained. Um, and so when they're out here, because they are small impoundments, the opportunity for success is much greater than what it would be if they were to go to a large reservoir. And in part, that's because of our hybrid bluegill stocking program. That's great. You know, I, my daughter, who's 22 now, caught her very first fish at a close to home waters, and I wish that it had been one of those hybrids. <laughs> they are fun. So now let's go visit Holdenville Fish Hatchery where they've been producing some of these hybrid bluegill. What we have in here is our hybrid sunfish, the cross between the bluegill and the green sunfish. These are, these are used for our close to home fishing program. Uh, there's about 10,000, right now they're a little over five inches, the, these will be ready to harvest here next month to be stocked into certain uh, of your me metropolitan areas for, uh, the, for the program. Uh, we feed these, these fish twice a day. Uh, and, and these, these are getting about 10 pounds each feeding and they, they feed really well. Uh, hopefully uh, we'll do really well with this this year we've had we've got ponds at all four hatcheries producing these right now and we're fixing to ramp up this whole program uh, to produce even more uh, because the demand has gotten gotten such they're about five to five and a half inches long uh, within a, within a month we'll be pushing over six inches and at that time we will we'll, we will harvest these these fish to be stocked There's approximately 10,000 that we stocked out in, in this pond. Uh, we're, we'll, we should get uh, 80, 80 to 90 percent return on that. Uh, the, these are just right at a year old at this point, which is really, really great. I mean, that's, you wouldn't expect them to get there. Uh, these are crossed between, not just the bluegill, but it's crossed between the copper nose bluegill, which is the southern variety of the bluegill. Yeah, that it, I guess you'd say evolved in the southern climate, where uh, basically they're the, they're the Florida bass of the of the sunfish. So. By far the most frequently used method for catching sunfish, including those hybrid bluegill, is with a bobber and worm. So for a shakedown and maybe a little bit of a refresher for you, let's catch up with Daniel Griffith on the best method for rigging up a bobber and worm. All right, so the, the reel that we use is a, a typical just plain spin cast reel. This is a really easy reel to use. It's pretty simple because there's just a one op. You just use this button back here to operate, releasing the, uh, to release the line. Let's go ahead and get started here. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and tie uh, my hook on. Uh, and we use, uh, Fishing Clinics here in Oklahoma, we use what we call the improved clinch knot. Uh, it's probably one of the easiest knots for you to learn to use. Uh, the first thing that you want to do is take your hook and run the end of the line through the eye of the hook. Okay, and then you're going to twist that line five or six times. 
And once you twist it, you're going to take the end of your line and run that through the loop right below the eye of the hook. And as you do that, you're going to create a second loop. This with that one. Creates a second loop that you're going to run your line back through, just like this. And one of the important things about fishing, and if you've ever been fishing before, is you want before you cinch that down, you want to actually wet that line. You can use your mouth, or if you're near the pond or the lake or something, you can get it wet in there, and then cinch that down nice and tight. But don't you don't want to pull it too tight. And when you're complete. You're going to have a little, you should have a little bit of a tail, and that's where you bring your line clippers in. And don't cut it too close to the knot because it will undo, but you want to leave just about maybe a, maybe about a quarter of an inch of that little, little bit left right there. So, and that's how we got our hook on there. Uh, next thing we're going to do is we're going to attach this split shot weight. And if you notice, it has a groove right there in the, in the air, kind of looks like a little Pac Man. And then there's also these little wings on the back of it. That's what they're referred to as wings. And those wings are designed so that if you, once you clip this on there, you can actually take it back off. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to take this little deal, put it right on the line, and then once you put it on the line, you grab your pair of pliers, and you don't want to squeeze too tight, but you just kind of crimp that down, and what it does is that it basically just ties, crimps that onto that line, okay? And it'll stay on there. Now, if you need more weight, uh, so if you're fishing somewhere where maybe the water's moving and you need a, you, or uh, you want to get down deeper quicker, you can actually just keep crimping on more of those. And to take it off, let me show you real quick, if we want to take that off, you see those little wings, if you take your pair of pliers and you squeeze those wings together, it'll open that mouth up and let you take that back off. And again, we can put it back on there, run that line down in there, and pinch that back on. So again, it's a reusable split shot weight. So if you end up want to put it on a different rig, you can take it off. So now that we have our basic rig here, we're going to put an earthworm on this line. And we have uh, basically a little styrofoam cup here of 18 uh, not Canadian night crawlers is what they call these. They're actually earthworms, but they're much larger than your normal earthworm that you find here in Oklahoma. Uh, now, with a hook this size, you're not going to be able to put this entire worm on there. Uh, so, if you're a little squeamish and you don't like doing this, you can use scissors to cut these worms or any other type of like a knife or something to cut them, but typically when I'm out there, I'll just take about a one inch piece of that worm and pinch it, put the rest of the worm back in my cup. You want to keep those worms nice and cold so they don't go bad. And then get our hook here. And I hold the, worm, I hold the hook like this and I actually stab the worm and run it all the way through. And then I'll kind of stretch the worm out and just keep doing this until I put that whole worm on the hook. And again, once I finish with this method, I want to make sure that the worm is down here on that bend of the hook and that that hook tip is almost covered. So right there, like that. So what this does, uh, this works, I feel like this works a little bit better because uh, that's more difficult for the fish to take uh, the worm off the hook. So, but again, those are one of the two methods you can use to get the worm on the hook. But again, the key with whatever method you use is making sure that the tip of the hook is covered. Uh, what, you, what you do not want is you do not want your worm to be slid all the way up the hook like this. That is incorrect because again, the fish will bite here and not get the hook in their mouth. So, you'll get a lot of uh, false false bites. All right, so we finished putting this worm on there. So let's talk a little bit about uh, these worms. And what I have here is uh, some worms that were that you can purchase from the store. A uh, lot of different bait shops, even some of your big retailers that have outdoor sections will sell these worms that you can purchase. Uh, you can also, if you want and you have the time, you can actually go in your backyard, dig up some worms. Uh, you know, to use your own and maybe get a styrofoam cup like this to put them in because you've got to keep them cool. If they get exposed to the sun too long or get too hot, uh, they won't survive and you want to keep them fresh. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Hope that you'll have a chance to get out and wet a line yourself, whether it's down in the pond in the pasture or in a close to home fishing pond right down the street. For all of us at your wildlife department, I'm Todd Craighead and we'll see you right back here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma.